virtually no analysis in any UN reporting in the World Bank or the EU or the United deals with the military balance of power. And Samuel Huntington, in his famous essay in the 1950s, says what causes wars are, is the re respective attitude of the two sides that eventually go to war in who can win and who, who's going to lose. You don't go to war if you think you're going to lose. Okay? Bashir was making a military calculation. He is, after all, a military officer. We forget that. We're not doing any of that. The reason the UN doesn't do this, frankly, and the EU doesn't do it, is because they don't have militaries. The British government and the American government are two governments that have, in fact, been providing military assistance to the South to turn what was a guerrilla army into a unified, which will take many years to do, decades to do, into a uh, regular conventional army that stays out of politics, by the way. That's one of the big messages of the US government and the British government is stay out of politics. The British have hired, as a consultant, the former chief of staff of the Ethiopian military. He's in Juba. He's been in Juba for several years now. AI, uh, I was going to say AID. We don't do this in AID. Um, the, the State Department in the military assistance program has a contract. I'm confusing my term as envoy with my term as administrator. Uh, we have a contract to bring 12 retired U.S. Army colonels to the South to help train the Southern military. Uh, I think there needs to be more analysis of this because, frankly, the military balance of power is what will determine whether conventional war will break out between the North and the South. Uh, we should look at the real politique, which we don't always do. One thing that I feel more open about saying is the leading factor for the continuation of the war in, in Darfur is often seen as the Khartoum government. The Khartoum government is certainly caused the problem uh, with chronic neglect, with the brutality and the atrocities of 2003 and 4. However, the Libyan government has 70 agents on the ground in Darfur. How do we know this? They told me when I was envoy. They have budgets, they have equipment. They did not say they had weapons, but we have other evidence from Chad and from other sources, not from U.S. intelligence sources, I'm not disclosing anything uh, that's, that's classified here, that they, they are the principal armor of Khalid Ibrahim, who was the head of JEM. And I asked the Libyans, why do you support Khalil? He's an Islamist. He's with Tarabi. He said, no, but Andrew, he's an Arab. I said, he's not an Arab. He's an, he's, if you ask him, he's an African. In, uh, it took me five years to get this straight. In Libya, the same tribe speaks the same language, they're genetically the same, are regarded as an Arab tribe. And the Zagawa of, of Libya regard themselves as Arabs. Now, Alex DeWall talks about this in his books and their sociological studies that indicate that, that the ethnic um, alliances of that region change even within the same tribe depending on what they do for a living, whether they're farmers or herders or commercial uh, uh, business people. And so but, but Gaddafi's policy has been to support for 40 years the Arab tribes in the north in their conflict across the Sahel, not just in Darfur, but also in Libya and in, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in Chad and in Niger. Across North Africa, he's been arming the Arab tribes in, in the conflict with the movement population pressures and all that. We do not understand. The Libyans have had a major role in Darfur. They are the ones who did not like the DPA. One of the major factors in the DPA failing was Gaddafi helped orchestrate its downfall because he did not like it because it frankly wasn't orchestrated by him. And one of the reasons we engage and continue to engage until recently with the Libyans in Darfur is because they have far more influence and weaponry going into Darfur than anyone wants to realize. Most of it goes through the Chadian government to the, to the gym. Two, this is related to the first point. This is my second point which is because the South has been a victim since 1956, and I'm not going to go through all the victimology, but there's a whole mindset in the West on victimology, and there's a reason for it. I mean, the four million Southerners died in the two wars, and there's, there's empirical evidence. Unlike some of the exaggerated estimates of deaths in Darfur, these, there was a demographer, um, uh, Burr, who's got a PhD, the American... Uh, 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 demographic, uh, American Social Science Association actually reviewed the methodology he did, he used to calculate four million deaths. Uh, and he did some extraordinary research. Far more people died in the South. But the South is about to become an independent state. In fact, there'll be two new independent states, completely different than what they were before. Northern Sudan will not be the state it was before. It is now 55% African, 45% Arab. And 
and it will be reversed. The new northern state will be 55% Arab and 45% African. The south, of course, will be 90, 95% African. The point here is the south is going to have its own foreign policy, its own interests. It's going to have an ambassador at the UN and the EU. It has a very well-developed policy. I know what it is. They're not, you know, unlike the north, the southerners are reasonably clear about what they want to do publicly and privately. They have not learned... Um, the art of diplomacy is sometimes not quite saying what you mean publicly. It's not a criticism. It's just a reality, okay? Uh, they actually tell you what their policy is and what they intend to do. Uh, but they are a nation state, and we should understand that they're not victims anymore. They get, what, Arab, what African state, when it became independent, got 3 or $4 billion in revenues on day one? Almost none of them. There's 400,000 people on the southern payroll right now, 300,000 people in the military, half of which are militias that the North paid to kill Southerners uh, for most of the war, who are now been absorbed in the SPLA. There is a little unease over that, but they're on the payroll. And then there's a regular army that's developing of 150,000 troops who, who are the real army of the South with a lot of weapon systems. The third point is that we're now dealing with the weakest government in Khartoum since 1956. Now, there have been weak governments before, but the weakness I'm talking about here is they've lost control, not just of the South. I mean, clearly they've lost control. Of the they don't have control in Darfur. They don't have control in the Nuba Mountains. They don't have control in, uh, in, uh, in Blue Nile. Malik Agar won the election 56% of the vote, and he's a Southern, he was a commander in the SPLM. And he won, uh, the SPLA, he won the election with 56% of the vote. So they don't even control uh, their own provinces in the north. And there's, a, of course, Abiy, which is continuing uh, strife. But even in the Red Sea province, which is principally Beja, the Beja people are on the edge of re re revolt again. They signed a peace agreement, none of which has been implemented by the central government. That's why peace agreements with the central government don't mean a lot unless you have an army behind them. That's the, the problem. That's the lesson should be, unless you have a large army standing behind a peace agreement, peace agreements, frankly, with the northern government are useless. They have learned how to pander to the rest of the world, have all these press conferences. They spend more money, by the way, in public relations than almost any other country in the world. They have an actual percentage of all ministry budgets that must be spent on press, press releases and media coverage. And the reason they do that is it, it, it disguises their enormous weakness. They are losing control of the country. The country is literally collapsing. The periphery of the country has been in turmoil, but they've lost control, and it's, it's, it's coming... Uh, 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 it, it, it's, it's contracting. The country is contracting. I don't mean just the South. I'm talking about the North now. And as a result of that, they've developed a siege mentality. President Bashir, in the last month since the Arab revolt started, has been meeting with different groups to try to calm everything down because they are the most vulnerable of all of the governments in the entire Arab world. He's met with four groups. He's met with senior generals. By the way, after the meeting, they purged 18 generals which is interesting. Their own generals went into rages against the regime for their corruption, their mismanagement. Uh, they, they've made enemies in the military. They don't, they don't trust their own military. There are only 5,000 troops of the Sudanese army in greater Khartoum because they are afraid of a coup against their own, uh, they're afraid of a coup by their own army against the regime. So they keep them out of, they hired a South African consulting firm, retired commandos in the South African military. The, the Northern government did this to get advice on how to stay in power. And the first thing was, get all your troops out. You were very vulnerable. Your military is very angry at you. They want to take you out. The only way you can have a coup, of course, effectively, is if you control a capital city. So if there's no troops in the capital city, you know, you're, you're much less risk of a coup. Who put down the revolt when Khalil Ibrahim took an entire group of Zagawa from Jem, all 800 miles from the Chadian border into Khartoum. He, he actually took the battle to within a few miles of the presidential palace. This was in April of 08. 